Public Health Service with the New York State Department of Health, as well as several contracted positions with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Throughout her life, she has had a passion for the environment and sustainable living and has volunteered in disenfranchised communities to address sustainable living, oh, excuse me, to address health disparities in the environment by incorporating Black history in her program. Governor Kathy Hochul appointed the new to the first African American to serve on the board of the Adirondack Park Agency in 2021. Benita serves on the boards of the John Brown Lives Adirondack Park Agency, um, excuse me, Adirondack Park um, Experience Museum, and Adirondack Center for Loom Conservation, Chaplin Hudson Power Express, Eagle Island Camp, Albany Riverfront Collaborative, and Cornell Cooperative Extension of Albany County. Finally, we have Consuela Tinsley, who will present Transgenerational Trauma, Experiencing Sarah Bartman in Black and Brown Spaces. Consuela Ten Tinsley, Nacido, now you know, you don't have to read this part for us, Consuela, because I don't want to butcher it. Okay, it's been a long time. Thank you. She was born and bred. In fact, I'm gonna let you do that. Good morning. Yeah, my name is Consuela Tinsley. Um, it's Nacido y Cayel, the barrio con Matia, Mexico con Alfar, Sazon, un Moton de Sazon. That makes it mean I was born and bred with a mix of sugar seasoning and soul from Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> Not to embarrass myself. <laughs> okay. Any more than I already have. All right. Um, thank you. She's the youngest daughter of Jonathan Tinsley and Dr. LaFont Roberta Jones. Wow, I love that name. And sister to Sean, Monique, and Sharif. Faye graduated from Virginia Union University with a BA in English Literature. She earned an, a Master's of Education from Grand Canyon University and simultaneously secured an MBA from Howard University and attended Gould School of Law at USC. Now she's a doctoral student in higher education administration here at the College of William & Mary. Highlighting her global exposure, they worked for HRH Sheikh Mansour al um, Nayan, am I saying this right? Nayan in Abu Dhabi, and later with the Arabian Group for Education in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So please join me in welcoming our first panelist, um, Haley Robinson. Um, Ms. Robinson, I will be advancing your slides, so please let me know. Give me a, sim a signal to change them. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I couldn't unmute for a second. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so excited and honored to be here, even if I couldn't be there in person, um, and to be in conversation with uh, my fellow panelists um, and everybody else in the room, both virtually and in person. Um, so while this picture on the screen right now is of incarcerated men at um, Clemens State Farm, in Brazoria County, Texas. Um, my presentation focuses on incarcerated Black women and girls um, and the ties that they had with one another in the Texas prison system in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. On October 2nd, 1907, Lula Sanders, a Black woman from Fort Worth, Texas, had been out of prison for nearly two months when she wrote to Texas Governor Thomas M. Campbell on behalf of the incarcerated Black women with whom she had served her sentence. 
She criticized Johnson Farm, the prison farm where she spent her sentence, and the punishment doled out to the many Black women and girls who served their sentences there. She emphasized, quote, there were never a more inhumane place in the world than there, end quote. Brutal punishments, backbreaking labor, medical neglect, and sexual violence character characterize the everyday experiences of incarcerated women at Johnson Farm. Lula Sanders' fellow women prisoners had urgently requested that Sanders speak as their representative, having, in her words, quote, gotten on their knees and begged me to make this appeal to you for their sake, end quote. So when Sanders returned to her home in Fort Worth, she felt an urgent sense of responsibility for the women at Johnson and the need to share the truth about their experiences. She knew she needed to help the women that she had left behind, but had lived, labored, and suffered with for two years, eight months, and 12 days. This presentation examines Lula Sanders' letter to Governor Campbell in relation to the ways that incarcerated Black women and girls in the Texas prison system created and sustained social ties to one another. While historians like Robert Perkinson, Jane Howe Gregory, and Talitha LaFloria have used her letter to discuss con the conditions that Black women prisoners face, I suggest that the letter both illuminates and can be illuminated by the social, their social ties. I explore the shape and impact of incarcerated Black women and girls' relationships to each other in two ways throughout this presentation. First, I explore the incarcerated Black women and girls' social ties through the stories that they told to state legislators in 1909. Then I return to Lula Sanders' letter where I consider, se consider several questions. How can we understand these incarcerated Black women and girls' pleas and Lula Sanders' obligation to them in terms of the social ties they forged? What did these relationships look like during their sentences? And perhaps most importantly, in what ways did their social bonds influence how they navigated and resisted Texas punishment? I insist that a focus on the social bonds of incarcerated Black women and girls enriches, enriches our understandings of their lived experiences. And I also argue that their relationships with each other reveal how both Lula Sanders and other incarcerated Black women and girls resisted and challenged the state's ideas and practices of punishment. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, although incarcerated women in Texas represented a small portion of the total incarcerated population, Black women and girls made up a vast majority of this number. For example, in 1902, the population of incarcerated women included five white women, seven women of Mexican descent, and 88 Black women. Eight years later, in 1910, the disparity was starker, even as the number of incarcerated women had decreased. 55 out of 60 incarcerated women and girls were Black. These women, and sometimes their young children, were, confi were confined on two East Texas prison farms between 1883 and 1912. Johnson Farm, which I mentioned the in the beginning of my presentation, was located in Walker County, the near the location of the state penitentiary and located approximately 70 miles north of Houston. In 1907, the women were moved to Eastham No. 2 in Houston County, which was located about 20 miles away from Walker County. Eastham No. 2 remained the women's prison farm until convict leasing was abolished in 1910. In the midst of violence, exploitation, and the absence of loved ones, many prisoners turned to each other for socialization, comfort, and care. Incarcerated Black women and girls lived and labored in close proximity throughout their sentences in the Texas prison system. If we could change the slide again. They slept in the same cramped quarters, worked alongside each other during the day, witnessed each other's punishments, and spent any free time in each other's company. They talked, they laughed, they fought, all of these things which they were also punished for um, by prison officials and guards. They took care of and supported each other through medical care, gossip, and everyday actions like helping one another dress when they were ill or injured. The shared time and space meant that they spent a lot of time together and knew each other in intimately. In the process, incarcerated Black women and girls forged important social ties that they valued and relied on to survive their sentence. I call these moments when incarcerated people supported and cared for each other practices of care. 
These practices of care were evidence of incarcerated people's social bonds and the occasional affection they had for one another. They also continued to affect some incarcerated women and girls even after they compl completed their sentence. While there are a number of instances that I could draw on to illustrate the import importance of practices of care and what they looked like, I will briefly focus on an incarcerated Black girl's experience of childbirth on Johnson Farm that appeared prominently in the 1909 legislative state investigation into the Texas prison system. The 1909 investigation was conducted by the Texas State Legislature with the purpose of examining the living and working conditions of incarcerated people. During the investigations, uh, the investigative committee interviewed incarcerated people, which granted incarcerated women and girls a rare opportunity to talk about their experiences. And although the threat of punishment loomed for many incarcerated people who spoke openly, many of them still spoke very candidly about their experiences. The 1909 investigation also gave uh, incarcerated Black women and girls the opportunity to speak about how they resisted the state's attempts to alienate them from their fellow prisoners. On June 24th, 1907, a heavily pregnant Black woman named Elvira Hallman worked in the fields near, at Johnson Farm. While guards had assigned her to complete work in the yard, the prison physician had claimed Quote, she preferred to go to the field, said it was too lonesome there at the house, and she didn't want to stay on the yard, end quote. Because she was so far along in her pregnancy, and all of the other Black men would have been in the fields all day, it's possible that Elvira wanted to be close to other Black women in case she went into labor. Jake Hodges, the former chaplain at Huntsville, the Huntsville um, Penitentiary, told the legislators a slightly different story. story. Hodges argued that Elvira had, quote, begged the captain not to make her go out for her water had already broke, end quote. This treatment of an incarcerated pregnant woman would not have been surprising. So it's entirely possible that Elvira had requested to stay behind, just as likely as she had requested to go out in the, go out in the fields with other women. Either way, she went to the fields with her fellow Black prisoners and then soon went into labor. As Holman hoed the field alongside other incarcerated Black women in her gang, her labor pains began. A prison guard left to find the prison physician, but he left Holman in the care of, quote, three or four old women, women end quote, who worked in the St. Genghis her. These older Black women prisoners attended to her during labor, namely a woman who went by Queen Bess. At the time of childbirth, Elvira was only 16 and away from her mother, grandmother, and other women who, who would have been support systems for her during childbirth. In slavery and freedom, childbirth for Black women was a communal practice that relied on the knowledge and efforts of other Black women. So the presence of these older Black women would not only have been necessary to help Elvira give birth, but may have also been comforting. Under a magnolia tree and surrounded by other Black women and girls, she lived and labored alongside. She gave birth to a girl whom she named Magnolia. Bess and the rest of the women swaddled the baby, quote, in those extra garments, end quote. A guard described these pieces of clothing, quote, as a good many garments, really more than was necessary, end quote. Another incarcerated woman who witnessed this, named Rosa Brewing, remembered that Queen Bess had wrapped the baby in her own dress. Because the state issued only threadbare striped dresses for incarcerated women to wear, these, quote, extra garments, um, were likely pieces of clothing other than their uniform that they had collected, traded for, bought, or received from home for purposes of self-adornment, uh, personal expression, or more practical purposes like warmth. For whatever purpose the extra clothing was used for, it was likely treasured by these women. To swaddle the infant in this clothing was a gesture of care and tenderness that they, ex they extended to Elvira and her infant. However, soon after birth, Magnolia died, and Elvira was discharged on November 30th, 1908. In the absence of medical care from the prison physician or support from families and home communities, these incarcerated Black women and girls cared for and supported Elvira and her infant during and immediately after childbirth. They engaged in a significant practice of care that helped Elvira survive a carceral institution that constantly devalued and brutalized Black women's bodies. While historians cannot know the full extent of the ways that incarcerated Black women and girls forged social bonds with each other, 
their social ties still become legible in rare moments like this, when they were the only ones to provide support, care, and kindness to each other. If we could change the slide, please. Elvira Hallman and the support she received from other from incarcerated Black women provides additional insight to understand the letter that Lula Sanders wrote to Governor Campbell, which I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation. The ties between incarcerated Black women and girls played a significant role in the everyday in their everyday lives and survival. So it's understandable that these relationships and the lives of these women continue to be significant after Lula Sanders completed her sentence. The care that Lula Sanders had for the women and the relationships she may have had become legible through her rhetoric and her calls for change. And on the screen right now is um, a conduct register record for Lula or Lou as she was um, written in the, the, the prison records, Sanders. Um, Lula Sanders centered, her, centered the experiences of other incarcerated women in her letter. Her firsthand experiences of cruelties perpetrated against her remain conspicuously absent from her writing, even though she had endured at least one whipping during her term. Instead, she centers and privileges the experiences of the women she was incarcerated with. She told Governor Campbell that a pregnant Louise Marshall had been forced into the fields despite telling a guard she could not work. Nellie Johnson, who was serving out her second term, was, quote, given some kind of medicine and from the effect died end quote. Alice Clements, quote, had the consumption and were put out on the gallery one cold evening and chilled to death, end quote. Lula Sanders understood the situation was life and death for the women still incarcerated and wanted the governor to know this. When the incarcerated women and girls at Johnson Farm begged Lula Sanders to help them, they knew that their account challenged the positive narrative produced by prison officials. While the women at Johnson had thought of conveying their message previously, when the Board of Prison Commissioners or the governor had previously visited, they, quote, were afraid to mention it, for if we had, it would have been hard for us, end quote. Indeed, Sanders argued that the narrative from the prison commissioners was, quote, a sad mistake, end quote. So the incarcerated women and girls placed their faith in Lula Sanders to transmit their message. Through the stories of her, of her fellow incarcerated women and girls, Lula challenged the state's narrative about punishment. Although she wrote the letter alone, it represented Black women prisoners' collective attempt at resisting the state's narrative about punishment. Because other incarcerated Black women had urged and trusted Sanders to write the letter for them, she became a mouthpiece for a collective narrative about Black women's suffering, abuse, and death inside the Texas prison system. In her letter, Sanders' care and respect for other incarcerated Black women and girls determined how she envisioned the future of Texas punishment. While the state sought to harm, expend, and ungender Black women and girls, Lula Sanders argued that the state had no right to do so. She did this in two ways. Her letter reveals a concerted effort to acknowledge these women as victims of state violence and insisted that they mattered despite the state trying to do otherwise. Second, her investment in the well-being of the women were central to her calls for immediate change. She implored with the governor, quote, Dear governor, I hope you will read this letter very careful and study over the matter and go down there right away and take action just as soon as you can, for those poor women are certainly abused and would be very glad for you to come to their rescue, end quote. The palpable urgency in this demand reflected Sanders insistence that change must come soon for the women imprisoned, even though any reform that Campbell may have decided to institute would not affect her, she knew that it would be instrumental for the survival of the women who had begged her to write. While the state's version of punishment devalued Black women's personhood and womanhood, Sanders' own experiences and the pleas of women and girls with whom she served her sentence led her to, de to demand Texas punishment needed to acknowledge that incarcerated Black women and girls were deserving of respect and care. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, some of you, my name is Benita Law Jow. I'm from, um, I live up near the Adirondacks. I live just north of Albany, New York. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with our area, um, I was appointed to, we have a, well, I'll show you the next slide. Um, I'd like to ask all the people in here. So I, I live just below this big green blob that you see on the map. Um, that's the Adirondack Park. I'm, my family's originally from Virginia. We've been in Virginia since the 1700s. So I'm the family historian, um, genealogist. I love Virginia, although I kind of have problems with Virginia and our history here. Um, but. Being a dietitian, um, I don't, for me, it's hard for me to separate nutrition from environmental health and all the other things, that, and even history. And so through my work with the health department over the years, I've really combined all, all the things that are, that are important to me, the history, the genealogy, the land. And in doing that, um, you know, people say, well, you're all over the place. To me, it makes sense. And so as I've looked at our connection to the land and to agriculture and to all those things. I've started food, food pantries. I've started um, uh, agricultural projects. I've started uh, community gardens. But I've also learned the history of the, of the land where we have been. And so through that, New York State has a really strong history with the Underground Railroad. And I've been involved in a lot of Underground Railroad projects that, I mean, if, if, if you don't know, New York has a lot of Underground Railroad history. Um, a lot of people realize New York, um, we kept large numbers of enslaved people. Um, people think, oh, you're up in the North. There's no, you know, slavery wasn't in New York. It was in New York and it was big. Um, but we did, we had a lot of allies and there were a lot of um, abolitionists that were scattered through New York State. So this is where the Adirondack Park is. It's in the Northeast corner of New York. It's this big blob. Um, we're, we're the largest park in the lower 48. People don't realize that. You can fit five national parks in our park. You can fit Yosemite, um, Yellowstone, Glacier National Park, Grand Canyon, and the Great Smokies all together in our park. And we keep adding to it. So um, through legislation, we have over four, 46 high peaks. Um, our highest peak is five over 5,000 feet. Uh, we're a unique patchwork of public and private land. People always ask, well, why don't we turn that into a national park? It's because people were living in the park before they before it became a park. So the way we designate the park on a map, if you ever look at a New York State map, you'll see this big blue line going around where the park boundaries are. We 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 always re to the park, you know, people living within the blue line. That's that area that that big green blob where this area is called um, the North Country. We refer to that all the counties up there, the 14 counties that touch the park. So that's that's the North Country of New York. So, excuse me. And the largest population in any of the towns in the Adirondacks. Is 4,000 people, and the smallest population is old, old, they're really villages. Um, the smallest population is 240 people. So I give you this background so you can understand the area where we where we currently have the park and the area that surround the park. Oh, I skipped a slide. Kind of. Yeah. Some, for some reason, it's not going. There it goes. Um, okay. So New York State um, has a history of incarceration. We had a governor, Governor Rockefeller, 
um, who created the Rockefeller drug laws. And what that did was it imprisoned at people for minor drug offenses. And that, that whole Rockefeller drug law was uh, adopted by federal, the federal government. So other states and all over the US, they use those rules to incarcerate people. And it helped really fill up our prisons all over the US. But New York State, we had 44 prisons throughout New York State. That's a lot for one state our size. Besides that, in the North Country, the area that I, I just showed you in the map, there were 11 prisons. And they were put there because, well, you know, there weren't any jobs here. We started shutting down our lumber industry because we were concerned about nature and we wanted to create this green space. The Adirondacks was a beautiful green space that we were trying to preserve, and we needed to stop the logging. If a lot of you may not realize that um, New Hampshire, for example, was basically deforesting, and you could barely find any old growth trees in New Hampshire. So New York created this beautiful green space called the Adirondack Park, but the people who lived in the park didn't have jobs. So essentially, they said, well, you know, if we put some prisons up there, then there'll be jobs, and it'll be good paying jobs because there'll be state jobs and they'll have all kinds of benefits. So New York has an incarceration rate of 306, 376 people per thousand. That's a lot. That's our jails, our prisons, our immigration detention centers, and our juvenile um, justice um, facilities. So 165,000 New York residents are behind bars or, or under some type kind of community supervision. It's not. I'm sorry for the jumping around. Um, so this shows some of the locations of where our prisons are. We have five prisons that are actually five prisons that are actually in the park, um, and then we had one federal prison that was in the park. We've closed down a few of them. We've closed down our shop facility, and we've closed down Camp Gabriel's, which was a medium to minimum security facility. But if you look where the little squares are in this picture, there are lots of prisons all around. And people traveled from in the park to those facilities for jobs and also from outside the park into the park to work in the facilities. So when we started closing the facilities, even now, um, this, the governor gets a lot of back, backlash because those facilities um, are being shut down because where are the jobs going to come from? What are you going to do in a place like this that we're trying to keep green? You can't drop truck chop down trees. Um, and so, I mean, a lot of our young people were taken off the streets in, in New York City and all over the state to fill these prisons for, for minor offenses. But in, in the meantime, oh, this is, it's not going there. So in the meantime, I cannot get this to, there you go. Um, I, it's, for some reason, it's jumping a slide. There it goes. I got that. Yeah. Sorry. So, so over time, we've learned that um, there's a community up there called Timbuktu. Black people ended up settling in the Adirondacks in the 1800s. When I talk about people people being in the Adirondacks, a lot of people who live in Albany and other parts of the state, they have no idea that we've ever been there. Black folks who live in Albany, they're afraid to go in the Adirondacks. They think there are bears up there. They know the prisons are up there. Whenever they go up to visit families, they're treated poorly. Um, it's cold up there. There are mountains up there. There are all these things that make them feel like, you know, why should I want to go up there? But we have a history. We've been there since the 1800s. There is a white abolitionist by the name of Garrett Smith who lived in New York City. He had lots of property. And so what he did was he gave over 120,000 acres to Blacks to live in the Adirondacks, free Blacks and people who were escaping enslavement. They were living in New York City in squalor. And the reason why he did this was because New York State had put a law in place that said, if you don't own 240 dollars $40 worth of land can't vote. So he figured, I'll fix these guys. You know, I'm going to give every Black person 
40 acres of land, and they'll be able to vote. So over 3,000 Black families signed up for this land. Wow. Some of them moved to the Adirondacks. Some of them did not. This, some of this, and there are several, 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 several settlements. One was called Timbuktu. There's um, Black, Blackville, and a few other communities that were established up in the Adirondacks. But this allowed them to vote. Some people never moved. They just paid their taxes on the land, but now they could vote. Well, so I apologize. So I have a friend, her name is Martha Swan, and she learned about John Brown because when Timbuktu was established, Garrett, John Brown actually went to Garrett Smith and said, you know, we've got all these black people that are you know, going up there to live, but they don't know how to live in cold areas like that. It's a rocky mountainous area. There's nothing but white people up there who are not going to receive them very well. I can go up there and help them. So John Brown, the abolitionist, went up to the Adirondacks and, and he, Garrett Smith gave him a piece of land and he settled on the land with all his children and, and his family. And he really helped make some inroads for, for those communities that were being up there. My friend, Martha Swan, over the years, she realized, well, you know what? Um, everyone tries to portray John Brown as being a really bad person. And his farm is still up in the Adirondacks. It's, a lot of people don't realize where he was buried or where, where um, his farm is. But it's in a town called North Elbow near Lake Placid. So it's within that green line, that green blob that I just saw showed you up there. Um, and ever since he died, uh, a woman had purchased the land. Her name was, I, I can't remember her last name, but it was her name was Mary. And she purchased the land to preserve it because the people who didn't like John Brown would have destroyed the farm. And then eventually it ended up in the hands of the state of New York. So Martha knew this whole story and she decided, well, you know what? Um, we need to preserve his history because if John Brown was living today, a lot of the immigrant issues, a lot of the civil rights issues, a lot of those issues would, you know, he'd be fighting against some of the injustices in the world. So she created this organization called John Brown Lives. And John Brown Lives' um, mission is, is not just to honor John, John Brown's forceful voice and bring in an end to slavery, but to take his lead and follow his footsteps, promoting social justice, human rights through reflection, activism, awareness and exploration, kinship and individual action. So this organization has been around since 1999. Um, Martha has, I mean, she's a force to reckon with. And we've done a variety of activities to really deal with immigration issues, to educate people, to talk about voter rights, um, to, to deal with mass incarceration. So we have a variety of activities that go on throughout the year. And a lot of people don't realize that the NACP would bring groups of people up to memorialize um, and to pay homage to John Brown every year um, since he died. Um, so when I talk about, when I bring people up to the Adirondacks and Folks don't necessarily like that I bring all these black folks up to the Adirondacks. But when I bring folks up to the Adirondacks, you know, I let them know the history and everything I do, I let them know the history of the Adirondacks. When I say we are here, we've been here, I let them know that we've been here since the 1800s and maybe even before that. We are here and we have every right to be here. So I bring them up so we can take space. I bring, I do volunteer work work with the Underground Railroad History Pro Education Center in Albany, and they have a group called the Young Abolitionist Leadership Institute. I bring kids up and we get to go, they get to go snowshoeing. They... Excuse me. If someone tries to join your lecture, can you just hit the blue and then button so they can join? Okay. Pardon me. You don't have to do that. Don't worry about Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I bring them up and we do a variety of activities up here. So I'll just run through a few of the things that we've been able to do to connect the people to the land. Um, but, you know, we've done surveys when we bring people up and they say, you know, I, I still don't feel comfortable coming here by myself. It, it feels very white. It doesn't feel welcoming. I see Confederate flags. I see just U.S. flags. I see Trump signs. But so our surveys are letting us know that, you know, folks still don't feel, feel comfortable coming up. But we still bring them up and we try to educate them. We've been, we have an Adirondack, Adirondack Diversity Initiative where we try to educate the police, 
the businesses, the state troopers, you know, that, you know, they shouldn't be doing this, why they shouldn't be doing this. And so we do everything we can to try to make them feel comfortable. I've been working with different people to help them establish, establish businesses in the Adirondacks. Um, excuse me, I'm losing, I'm just losing my voice. So I've brought young people who are um, women who were recently um, incarcerated. They've approached me and said, look, you know, we need to do something to get out of the city. And I've walked them up and we've hiked to the summit of a mountain in the Adirondacks. And I mean, when we get to the top and they see the views and on their way up, they start to talk to each other about the trauma they face. And just to you know, know how nature is so cleansing. You know, I whenever I just need to clear my head, I'll drive to the Adirondacks just to clear my head. When they, they actually hiked a mountain and got to the top and they all started crying. And I started crying because it was, you know, just blew me away what it meant to them. So I'm constantly bringing people up to the Adirondacks because I know what nature can do. I know how it can heal. And, you know, just to hear the history of um, um, Harriet Tubman and other people in our culture, we who have always been connected to the land. And so, you know, I try to reconnect people to the land through agriculture, through, you know, just nature and hiking, kayaking in a variety of other ways. I, um, as you can see, I bring kids up and we do community building. Um, just, just to have people who wouldn't normally even hang out together. If we go kayaking or, and do some of these activities, all of a sudden they're building friendships, they go back to their communities and they do incredible things. And, and parents, to have the parents involved. I mean, we have, so many of our young men have never been fishing, have never you know, done these things with their kids. So just when we start to introduce them to them and give them the skills to do these things, they start to plan a lot of these activities on their own. I teach community science. So I've actually gotten people out in the community and let them know, where's your water coming from? When that guy over there is changing his oil in the street, you know, where is it going? Where, what's your source of drinking water? But I bring them up there. What I do at first is really to connect them to nature in their community because it's hard to get us out of our community sometimes. And with the Adirondacks, they really don't feel safe going there. So once I do a few activities in the community and get them to trust me and understand how this can help them, then I can bring them up to the Adirondacks. But here we have a stream that runs through Albany and I'm, I've had them come out and test the stream to see how healthy it is. And I've let them know about the, where the source of drinking water is and why some of the things they do in the community really you know, impact all of us. I'm an outdoor Afro leader. It's a national organization. Um, what we do with outdoor Afro, um, our mission is to celebrate, inspire Black connections and leadership in nature. So all of the things that I do tie in with the mission of Outdoor Afro, the, just to be tied in with this organization helps me market and attract people to the activities that I do. It's a national organization, so I'm sure I know there's a chapter here in Virginia. I'm also on the board for the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation. And loons are a black bird. It's a waterfowl that looks, it duck, people think it's a duck, it's not a duck, but it's actually a sensible species. It lets you know when an environment isn't necessarily healthy. So you've got wounds on a particular particular body of water and it's not there anymore, then you know something's wrong. And so we bring people, we take them canoeing and we talk about things in nature and how when things aren't right, you start to see certain animals disappear. You start to see, you know, your water is no longer healthy. Certain insects disappear. I also bring people up to the Adirondacks because I'm on the board for Eagle Island Camp and I get kids into Department of Environmental Conservation camps where they learn all kinds of environmental skills. They go back in Albany. We have a problem with oil trains coming through Albany to a low income community, polluting the community. So any way that I can figure out how to get us connected to nature, to get us to understand the environmental injustices that have done to us um, and to understand that the Adirondacks are, are the lungs of this world, of this of our world. It's six million acres, over six point one million acres. So we're not just, you know, providing carbon sequestration sequestration for Albany or for New York State. It's for our, you know, for our world. And so we need to protect these kinds of environments and keep adding 
to, to um, adding to clean land and, and protecting our, our environment. So kids get to go to Eagle Island. Because I'm on the board, I get inner city kids up to Albany, I mean, up to the Adirondacks to be at this camp. I bring women up. We have a Women's Health Week. I do a first-time camper program. I get families that have never you know, gone camping before to spend time together for kids to be safe and wander through the woods. I get our environmental conservation staff. They volunteer and come out in our communities and teach them about the environment that we're in at the time, but also connected to where they are at home. But it also, but I always incorporate Black history in every single activity that I do. You get to learn about the land and the Indigenous people on the land. So I'm on the board for the Adirondack Experience Museum. It's a museum that's over 121 acres. It's got ponds. It's got all kinds of um, history about the Adirondacks. But we're missing from that history. Because for years, no one ever told folks that we are here, we've been here, and that you know we have every right to be there. And our current director, he's gone out of his way to be more inclusive. And we're raising money. We're, we're doing the research right now. We're doing the education right now. And we're really working to create a gallery on the campus, because the campus is made of 24 buildings. So we're um, raising the money to create this gallery that's going to give the Black history that's been missed for so long. And the, the final thing is that we um, we do a bus trip. Every I've gotten funding to bring people from four, five different cities in New, in New York State to the Adirondacks, and they spend a the day there, and they learn about the Adirondacks. They learn about the history. And the neat thing about it is by bringing all these folks there, they, you know, they're learning and they're creating community and they're really, I mean, once, unfortunately, they're still saying, we won't come up here unless you bring us up here or we're here as a group. So that's something that we're still working on. But if you want to learn more about Blacks in the Adirondacks, these are some of the books that um, have recently come out. Um, Alice, grew, Alice Green grew up in the Adirondacks. Um, her family, they were miners up there. Um, Amy Gadon's book, The, the Black Woods, um, is a, more, a book that talks about the 1800s and 1900s with Blacks on the Adirondack frontier. Um, Blacks in the Adirondacks is, is a book that kind of spans a, a, a wider range of time. And then we have a book that talks about prisons in the Adirondacks. Thank you. Oh, the other thing is, um, if you want to learn more about um, the Adir our gallery that we're putting together and the history that we're doing in the Adirondacks, I'll have a brochure for you to um, have. Okay, hello. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Hello. I want to speak. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to be as quick as possible because I know people are. Okay. Um, my name is Consuela Tinsley, and uh, I am a doctoral student here at the College of William Mary. My current research is investigating the high attrition rate of HBCU presidents within the last decade in the Southeast of the United States. And my topic is, my back is not your bridge, Trans, transgenerational trauma experiencing Sir Bartman in black and brown spaces. I wanted to uh, reiterate that when I say black and brown, I'm not only talking about black and Latino because I'm both. I'm speaking about the caste system in Asia, 
as well, and Pacific Islanders as well in Northern Africa. Thank you, Sarah Barton. Okay, uh, for those who don't know, Sarah or Sartiji, uh, Bartman was known as the hot and hot Venus. Uh, she was among the first black women subjected to human sex trafficking during the early 19th century. Her body, particularly her large buttocks, was exploited and sensationalized by Europeans who exhibited her in freak shows across Europe. Bartman's experience symbolizes, thank you, <laughs> symbolizes the intersection of racism, sexism, and colonialism highlighting the dehumanizing impact of exploitation faced by Black and Brown women. Her story underscores the enduring legacy of gentrification and serves as a reminder of the injustices perpetuated during the era of colonialism. Uh, basically, quickly, the purpose of my presentation, as you already know, uh, is to understand Bartman's life and its present-day implications and analyzing the multifaceted impacts of transgenerational trauma while discerning both shared and unique experiences among black and brown women. The goal was to spotlight the trauma, amplify effective voices, guide policy, and catalyze educational initiatives for healing and understanding. Okay, that's not all that I had. I don't know what happened. To the rest, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, y'all go eat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, real quickly. Uh, Bartman, uh, she was born in Eastern Cape in South Africa, lost both of her parents at a young age. She married a drummer at 17, had a baby who later passed away. She was sold in slavery to a trader by the name of Pieter Wilhelm Cesar, who took her to Cape Town, where she became a domestic slave to his brother, Hendrik, on October 29th, 1810. Although she could not read, we need to really make that point clear. She could not read. She was 21 and supposedly signed a contract to Wilhelm Dunlap, a physician who was a friend of Cesar's brothers. Now, what uh, Dunlap did, he was one of the people who thought that Black women and our skin, we, were, we had a high threshold of pain because of our shape. And how we were, uh, how we walked, and the protruding buttocks and our breasts. So, in his mind, he thought that because we weren't compared to the figures of European women, the threshold of pain and what we could endure will be just, we will be okay with that, you know. So, that you have to, he was one of the uh, individuals in the medical field who believed that, and some of his thought processes are still relevant today. You know, which is very scary because uh, if you go to Harvard Medical School, they do speak of him in a way of a certainty in a, in a more positive way. So uh, it's very, very, um, we have to be mindful of that. And the reason why I call this gorgeous, beautiful, intellectual, graceful, uh, to uh, Sataji, uh, and also better intellectual, elegante Sataji, is because these are the words that I'm pretty sure she did not hear. These were the words that she did not hear all the time. And as black and brown women in spaces like intellectual spaces and office spaces, very seldom we hear those things. You know, we, we don't hear that we're gorgeous and beautiful and intellectual unless it's within a realm of our own community. So I say, I call that section, the slide that because I'm pretty sure she doesn't know and she never really referred herself as one. And that's the sad thing. So that was why I named it that. Um, her contract required her to travel with the Cesar brothers and Dunlap to England and Ireland where she would work as a domestic servant since technically slavery has been abolished in Great Britain. So she was still a slave, so to speak. You know, she still endured everything, the trauma, the psychological, mental abuse, but on paper and legally, you are a domestic servant. Uh, she will then be exhibited by entertainment purposes. Barman will receive a portion of earnings from her exposition, expositions and will be allowed to return to South Africa after five years. However, the contract was false. Now, when they say uh, entertainment purposes uh, in Belgium under King uh, Leopold, they will have uh, these uh, they will have these zoos for uh, the men and women in Congo. And what they will do, they will take them to Dutch lands and they will have these uh, people 
to touch them and prod them and things of that nature. So that is what the entertainment purposes of. Um, it was very graphic. Uh, there were times where they would touch Sarah's private parts. They would uh, grab her buttocks. They would tell her, even when she says no, they would beat her. They would tell her she will never see her land again. You had some men that tried to kiss her. You had some um, people feel her hair. And when I say they literally, you had uh, Dr. Dunlap uh, one time had her lay down and open her legs to see if the parts were the same. So these were the things that were exhibited. You had people playing with her uh, with her um, vagina. You had people trying to put things in to see if she would react. So these are the things that she went through. And as black and brown women, I, I can honestly say, um, being curvy, being being something um, in, in a space where you are curvy, you do get looks. You know, you automatically are assumed that you are sexual, not intellectual. You are there for a prize of a moment of temporary pleasure of somebody there. And, you know, um, you know, not my man, you ain't going to be around him. You know, so we, we have those types of things. We have those types of insecurities. So um, Sarah was a slave for the rest of her life. She never went back to uh, South Africa. She never saw her homeland grow. She stayed uh, in France. She stayed in England. Um, in 1994, South African President Nelson Mandela formally requested that Bartman remain to be returned to South Africa. France said no. What the French government said was, well, these are our bones. These are our things. And everybody wants to see them. Uh, Mandela, like, really urged. She was a, you know, he was a very cavalier gentleman. He said, she belongs to Africa. She's South African. At least let us let us bury her properly. France said no, because you're taking away um, a learning expedi expedi exhibition from younger people. And it was, it was an ongoing battle. France was saying no, that her bones, her body belongs to us. This is ours. And you had uh, people of the Zulu nation said, well, she's Zulu, and it's a proper way for us to bury her. And they said, you know, France said, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that. So um, in 2002, her remains were returned and buried, and she was buried, she was buried, um, she was buried correctly due to her uh, village, the Zulu Nation. Um, when it comes to transgenerational trauma, as black and brown women in spaces, we often find, find ourselves to be somewhat, we have to be on, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we are you know, not too on, because we don't want to mess things up. We always have to find a way to make white women feel comfortable. That is the mindset. Like, you have to play the game. You have to play the game. Yes, you know, yes, know the answer in class at, at William & Mary, but don't know it so well, because you don't want to make your other white counterparts feel like, you know, who you think you are. You know, I was, I was in that position, and, um, you know, my poppy, my father was like, well, that's just how it is. You know, and my, my abuela, his mother didn't say anything, but we're going to get to that later. But, um, but uh, you know, it, it, that's what we do. We have to be on. It's like with Paul Lawrence Dunbar said, we wear the mask that grins and lies that hides our face and hides our time. We have to do that for protection. And I think it's a transgenerational thing. You know, um, as an immigrant, you know, my, some of my people are immigrants, you know, from DR, and they're told, like, you don't want to do this, you don't want to do that. As black and brown women, we're taught that we can be feminine, but not too feminine. You can't be too feminine because of the simple fact that uh, femininity may, may have some sort of, may have some sort of um, effect. Uh, however, I want to uh, really, I want to uh, read this uh, poem by Rosario Morris. It's a Morales. It's called uh, I Am What I Am. And um, this is what my, my Abuelita uh, read to me when I told her I got into uh, Delta Sigma Theta. And she said, okay. She said, oh, okay. And she didn't know what it was. She was like, can't? Yeah. I was like, nothing. And, and she said, well, what are you going to tell them? I was like, I'm going to tell them nothing. Like, she's like, well, you're going to tell them that you a Latino? I was like, well, no, uh, well, they, they just see me black, I'm, I'm good. Right? And it kind of hurt her 
because she was like, no, mama, you, you know, so um, she gave me this poem, I don't want to cry. Um, okay, it's by um, Rosario Morales. It says, I am what I am. Uh, I am what I am, and I am a U.S. American. I haven't wanted to say it because if I did, you take away the Puerto Rican. But now I say, go to hell. I am what I am, and you can't take it away with all the words, the sneers at your command. I am what I am. I'm Puerto Rican. I'm a U.S. American. I'm New York, Manhattan, and the Bronx. I am what I am. I'm not hiding under no stoop, behind no curtain. I am what I am. I am Boricua, as Boricuas come from the Isle of Manhattan, and I croon Carlos Sarda, tangles in my sleep, and Afro-Cuban beats in my blood, and Xavier Cucar, lukewarm land, and so familiar and dear. Sneer, dear, but he's familiar, dear, but not Carmen Miranda, who's a joke because I was never a joke. I was a bit of a sensation. See, here's a true, honest to God, Puerto Rican girl, and she's polished. Hey, Mary, come here. Look, she's from here, a South Bronx girl, and she's honest to God in college now. Ain't that something? Who would have believed it, it ain't science wonderful or something such a wonder, such a wonder? She gave me this uh, because she wanted to tell me that you need to be proud. You know, she wanted to cut that transgenerational trauma of hiding. You know, you can't hide. You know, like she said, no, no, it's you like you can't hide. So, um, you know, I, I did, I told them and I got jeers. Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, got to fight with one of my deans because she was like, no, nah, you don't look it and that sets me off. But, um, <laughs> so my line got in trouble, but, but, uh, but, the fact of the matter is that women like Sarah Bartman use her back as a bridge, so I wouldn't do that. You know, she she used her back, you know, as a bridge. My my abuela was like, you don't have to do that anymore. Your back is your back. You don't have to bend down anymore. You don't have to apologize anymore. You don't have to hide from an entity anymore. If you know the answer, she told my father in private, because in Caribbean households, you know, got to be, but she said, you don't have to do that anymore. You know, you don't have to be ashamed of who you are. Anymore. You know, so what uh, Sarah Bartman did was teach us that she used her back as a bridge, the digging of the, the heels and everything, so we can stand with the pristine glow. Our skin doesn't have to be thrashed, you know? So that, that was why I said my bridge is not your back, because I'm not going to do that. I will tell you what my abuelito said, but He's more of a red fox guy, so <laughs> so so take it as you will. But um, I think in in these types of spaces, black and brown women, we we have to stop. You know, Sarah Sarah took the lashes for us. We don't we can't keep apologizing. We can't apologize for knowing and going and growing and doing something. If someone says, "Oh, you know, you went to Saudi Arabia. Were you in the military?" No. I used my brain. What? Yes, I did. I used my brain. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to hide. We don't have to coddle. We don't have to make excuses. We don't have to put our head down because Sarah, that back, she was our bridge, you know? And this, like I said, not only black and brown women, the women in India no longer have to do that anymore. They're proud of their black skin. Women in Asia as well, you know, we have to stop doing that. You know, we have to stop apologizing because Sarah already did it, so um, I would speak first, but I know everybody's hungry. So I'm going to uh, leave you right now, and I thank you. Consuela, you can't eat yet. Yeah. <laughs> you have to answer some questions. Thank you so much to all the three of the panelists. Um, To borrow a concept from Haley Robinson's paper, all three of these wonderful scholars highlight practices of care. Haley Robinson reflected this in the practices um, of women who were incarcerated in Texas, the practices of care that they practice. Benita Law Zhao exhibits these practices of care through her work to claim space in the Adirondacks and to expose others to the beauty of that environment. And Consuela Tinsley showed us these practices of care in her discussion of the efforts of Mandela 
and the people of South Africa to return to their apartments remain and in the practices of care that she showed us so lovingly by her abuela. So I want to thank them for that. Does anyone have questions for our panelists? I'm just curious to know whether uh, Sarah Bartman was ever um, uh, put on display in this country, in the United States. Um, from what I found, uh, I don't think so, but I know in France, because they didn't make a lot of money from her. Um, they, uh, they didn't even return any of the money back to South Africa, even when it part of it. Uh, you had a lot of, you know, senators and congressmen, the folks that went there, to like, you know, have to return it. They didn't do that. But, um, yeah, I mean, France was really, they were not going to return because they were them anyway. Mine is quick. It's for Ms. Benina. You said you are also members of the government. You didn't share with us one part of Virginia or the area. Mecklenburg County. Um, my family's, yeah, traced my family back to the 1750s. And, and I, I think some one branch of it might even be, um, they might, they were probably Irish that lived. Blacks and Irish that live together. Um, so I've been trying to figure out if they were indentured servants or enslaved Irish that lived among Blacks, um, trying to figure out when they came over it. And so, Matt, I'm right now. And I just wanted to share with you as uh, corporate uh, people, my husband and I and our daughters went um, four consecutive summers when we went to New Jersey going to Lake George and with one of her babies. Fun thing to do. So I do have great memories of that. Uh, Thank you for sharing. I was just wondering for the presenter online um, if you are also researching the violations, infractions, uh, crime, if you will, um, of those incarcerated in Texas, um, because many times there it wasn't a crime. Um, it was something very minor, um, and uh, you know, it was became an issue of labor, um, and so even post emancipation, we are still, uh, you know, it's still free labor, it's still enslavement. So I'm just wondering if you are also researching the different types of infractions. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I definitely um, at, after emancipation, like you said, it's it becomes an issue of um, conflicts about labor. So um, in after emancipation in Texas, um, that people are incarcerated, sentenced to longer terms for either very minimal crimes or um, uh, for crimes that in pe incarcerated people would say that they, they weren't guilty of um, <clears throat> and sentenced for, for long amounts of time. And a lot of, I, I have seen in the archive, um, people when given the opportunity to uh, talk about their um, experiences with the criminal legal system, that there are quite a few people who say um, that um, they weren't guilty of their crimes. And the the, the idea of um, a convict leasing of the expansion of, of incarceration after the Civil War ends as uh, a type of reenslavement is like really prominent in the scholarship on incarceration after emancipation. Um, and I do see that to an extent um, that it becomes a way for um, prison officials, state officials, not just in Texas, but across the South um, and even in the West um, to harness black labor um, and control it and control their bodies. Um, and that shift really does come after the Civil War. Thank you. Yeah. You have any more questions after? Yes, hello. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you, ladies, for sharing your information. Ed and I, we lived in Plattsburgh, New York, for almost five years, and I am a SUNY graduate. But what I wanted to ask you, Ms. Benita, um, have you had any experience at Camp Bedford with any of your work? No, have, not at all. Have you have you heard of Cap Bedford? No, but what is it at? Do you remember it? Well, 
we're not sure, but anyway, it, I mean, it's just beautiful. We used to um, help with the uh, Boy Scout, able to Boy Scout um, leader there, and I was one of the nurses that was assisting. So we had a wonderful experience. But some of the things that you were talking about when we were living in Plattsburgh, I mean, we got so many stares as if, where, where, where are you coming from? And we were there from 1985 to 1989. So you were there? No, from 1989 to 1993. You were there on the Air Force Base. How was that Yes. Yeah. 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 And so that's that area, the blacks that were in that area were there because of the Air Force Base. A few of them settled in the area, but when you come into the Adirondacks, you know, we're here, but you don't see us. We're not that visible. And then, you know, when things happen to, to us, where the police stop us, we're driving while being black, um, or we stay in hotels because we have a loved one in a correctional facility, you know, people or you walk in stores and people are following you. Um, you know, people don't know where to go for help. And that's why we've done a lot of the things that we're doing right now to bring people up, to show them that there are those, their allies up there that want you there, you have every right to be there, and we're gonna make sure you, you know, have access like everyone else. I recall there was a uh, prison, a prison, a prison up there called uh, Navajo. It's still there. <laughs> one of the old school. Pardon me? It's like a big fortress. Yeah, it's the oldest prison in the Adirondacks. Okay, we're gonna squeeze in one more question. Right. This, is, this is for you, and right. 40 acres times 3,000. How much of their land is to be still on? None of it. You know, this, I knew that was going to come up. The unfortunate thing is that, you know, people got the land so that they could vote. Once the Civil War was over, you know, it, it's rocky land. It's hot. That's why um, John Brown went up there. He went up there to help them settle on the land, help them learn how to manage the land. But the people, when they got the land, they thought the land would be, they'd all be living together in a community. He gave them, a, uh, Gerald Smith gave them the impression that it would be all near each other. Was, we have a map now, and especially in one of the books, that showed that the land, they weren't close to each other. Every, people were living really far from each other. The few that stayed up there, and, and yeah, they just really were up there by themselves. It was harsh. It's, winters are, are really bad. And so no one, no one had that land because, you know, when I first heard of this, I thought that someone was stolen their land. A lot of folks, once they were able to vote and everyone was able to vote, they stopped, you know, paying the taxes on the land and, and those so they took it. Yeah, but a few people, a few people did stay up there. Eventually, so some of, from what I understand, some of those families that were black intermarried with whites, and so the, the ones that are mixed black and white, they don't tell people that their ancestors were black. You know, so they're kind of turned white over from generations. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Now, please don't eat. Thank you.